Thank you, Sabrina. Hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, we'd like to discuss with you all today about stressors on biodiversity and natural resources. Now, when we say the word stressors, the first step that we're going to have to do is we're going to need to define exactly what we mean by a stressor on biodiversity and natural resources. And so what does that mean? Well, the way we're going to define it in this presentation is any sort of process or condition that will reduce biodiversity or reduce natural resources in the Sargasso Sea. And so when we're planning policy around stressors on biodiversity, the first step will be to identify exactly what these stressors are. And what we found initially is that this can be a bit of a challenge if we're going to just simply try to list a comprehensive list of stressors on the Sargasso Sea. It's a pretty big area. So when we talk about stressors, we'd see anthropogenic CO2 emissions. We'll see ocean acidification. We'll see destructive fishing techniques. As you see, <laughs> as you can see here, I mean, this is by no means, I would say that this is a comprehensive list. I would say that this is just one sample of a very long list of potential stressors in the Sargasso Sea. So the step here, once we've identified potential stressors, the next step, really what we want to do to create effective management strategies is to create a prioritization and organize these stressors. And that's largely what we want to do first before we proceed forward. And so when we talk about creating priority with these stressors, we want to look at a variety of factors, and this is what will help us identify exactly what we want to target in terms of mitigating and resolving different stressors in the Sargasso Sea. The first one being the area of the ecosystem impacted. This is talking about the scope. Some stressors that we'll see will be affecting the entire Sargasso Sea, others on a more local level. And so this will be an important factor that we consider when we're talking about these various stressors. Next, we want to talk about timing. We want to talk about how immediately or how long, how prolonged is a certain stressor affecting the system. Next, we want to talk about what is happening at the current moment to mitigate these potential stressors, mitigating these impacts. Do we know what's going on? Do we know what we should do? Do we know what we need to do? Are we doing it currently? Next, an important point, political feasibility. We've talked already. We've heard from the governance and stakeholders section. We want to, we want to talk about you know, an area that is beyond national jurisdiction for a large part of the Sargasso Sea, and that's going to be a factor in how we approach these potential stressors. And the last major factor is the synergism between these factors and other stressors. So we have a lot of these stressors that can have very broad overarching impacts that will feed into other stressors that can potentially magnify or even reduce impacts on other stressors. So this will be a very large portion of how we decide which of these stressors we're going to approach. And using these five factors, we've developed five major categories of overarching stressors that are in the Sargasso Sea that we're going to talk about today. First one we want to talk about is plastic pollution in the Sargasso Sea. Kata will be telling you about plastic pollution in the Sargasso Sea in terms of major, significant, large plastic items in addition to microplastics and how that's affecting the Sargasso Sea as a whole. Next, we'll be talking about invasive species. Margaret will be formatting how invasive species both affect an ecosystem in general and the invasive species that we'll be seeing in the Sargasso Sea specifically. <coughs> And last but not least, we'll be discussing climate change, what we believe is perhaps the greatest and most overarching stressor on the Sargasso Sea. Grayson will be giving us details on that. We'd also like to point out that we discuss maritime traffic and fisheries as a stressor on biodiversity and natural resources in the Sargasso Sea. However, we can't simply call both maritime traffic, as in major shipping and fisheries, simply stressors, which is why we have two presentations following this one to discuss maritime traffic and, and fisheries in a more multi-dimensional sense, uh, rather than just simply a stressor on biodiversity and natural resources. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Kata, who will discuss with you plastics and how that is potentially stressing the Sargasso Sea. All right, before I get to the meat and potatoes of my talk, I'd like to ask everyone a few questions. Um, how many of you own something with plastic in it? <laughs> Great. Now, how many of you have ever thrown plastic away without recycling it? OK. And how many of you have recycled plastic? Awesome. So the point that I want to make right here is that plastic pollution is a global problem. It's not something that's far away and untangible. The problem is us, but in us being the problem, we are also the greatest solution. We are the ones that can tackle this problem. <coughs> And I'd like to start off by giving you a little bit about the scope of this problem. So every single year, um, 
we have 8 million metric tons of plastic entering the global oceans. To put this in perspective, that's roughly the weight of 44,000 blue whales. Currently, the blue whale population is somewhere between 9 and 20,000. So we're putting in more plastic every single year than there are currently blue whales left in the oceans. 80% of these plastics are coming from land-based sources. It's not just a matter of fishermen dumping their netting out at sea or someone mindlessly throwing a plastic bag away on the beach. It's coming directly from where we are in Woods Hole and as far away as Minnesota, where I'm originally from. And finally, it takes 450 years for plastics to decompose in the ocean. So what we're seeing right now is this huge influx of plastics into the oceans um, coming from all over the globe, and they're not going anywhere. On a human time scale, they're there permanently. <clears throat> so the Sargasso Sea is a hot spot for the accumulation of these plastics because of the way that the currents move. Um, I don't believe anyone has talked about this yet today, but the Sargasso Sea is bounded by four major currents, or five, um, two to the south, one on the west, one to the north, and one to the east. The way that these currents move together, it um, makes it really easy for the currents to pick up debris and dump it right into the middle of the gyre, which is where the Sargasso Sea is located. Uh, this study done by Kara Lavender Law, who is an SEA researcher, uh, showed that the highest accumulation of plastics was right within the Sargasso Sea. Uh, this is a problem for all of the species that we've been talking about today. We're having huge amounts of plastic being dumped into the oceans at a critical spot. Uh, these plastics are dangerous not only because of their immediate threats, uh, ingestion, suffocation, and entanglement, but they can also carry very harmful toxins that are a danger to the organisms that are ingesting these pieces or potentially altering the chemistry of the water. So there are a couple different international policies that are um, addressing this issue. The first that I'd like to draw your attention to is the London Protocol. Um, it limits the amount of waste input to the oceans using a classification system. Uh, there's a blacklist and a gray list. Blacklist uh, contains strictly prohibited items, and the gray list contains items that are allowed to be dumped with special permission. I'm not going to get into it any more than that, because what I really want to draw your attention to is MARPOL 73-78 Annex 5. Uh, this addresses the disposal of garbage in oceans. Currently, there's a restriction on plastics. Um, it, it's completely prohibited by all ships that are traveling throughout the world's oceans. However, um, enforcement is rather lacking. It, enforcement is up to the nations that are party to this treaty to uh, carry it out. So when ships go into port at a nation where they are party to MARPOL 73, 78, um, it's the responsibility of those nations to make sure that this is properly enforced. As you can imagine, this doesn't always happen. So, what we're having right now is there are plastics being put into the oceans at an alarmingly high rate. Uh, the gyres where we have hot spots of biodiversity are the areas where we're seeing this high rate of accumulation. They're posing significant health threats, and there's lack of sufficient enforcement for this existing policy. More so than all of these factors, this is our problem. Our pristine landscapes are turning into our waste bins, and we're not doing enough about it. So what we want to do are a few things. <clears throat> we would recommend that Bermuda take initiative and set a recycling program. Currently, there is no recycling program for plastics in Bermuda. Although they are tiny, um, although they are small, we think that they could have a huge impact by taking this step and showing the world that they're ready to do something about plastic pollution in the Sargasso Sea. Uh, secondly, we recommend that there be international collaboration for land-based management strategies rather than just sea-based stra strategies. Um, because the majority of plastics are coming from the land, land-based strategies and ending up in the oceans, we believe it is very important to broaden our scope and make sure that we are looking at the whole picture rather than just one slice of the pie. And finally, we recommend that the, the current restrictions of MARPOL Annex 5 be brought in to encompass a wider variety of ships. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Margaret to talk about invasive species in the Sargasso Sea. All right. 
So thank you, Katha. So invasives in the Sargasso Sea. Invasive species are a huge problem. So first I'm gonna talk about what an invasive species is. Invasive species can be terrestrial, aquatic, or marine organisms that are taken from one place and end up in another place. So to give you an example, I'm gonna focus on the main or potential main invasive in the Sargasso Sea, which is the lionfish, which was shown on the previous slide. So the lionfish is a native to the Pacific Ocean, but through accidental aquarium release has ended up in the Atlantic Ocean and has started to cause a huge problem in the reef systems um, in Bermuda and also all along Florida and the Caribbean. So the lionfish is destroying native reef populations, which is not only harmful to the coral reef ecosystems, but also to our economy as we depend on coral reef fishes for fisheries. So the lionfish fills all of these expectations of an invasive species. It's not native to the region. It's shown a rapid expansion, as I'll show in a later slide, and it's had a negative effect. So now I'm gonna talk about how some of these invasive species are getting to these areas, with the first and major one, ballast water. So ballast water is what ships use to stabilize themselves during transit across the ocean. So when a ship is getting ready to travel at its home port, it fills up its cargo holds with ballast water, which contain these little organisms represented here. So as the, as the water goes onto the ship, the little organisms come with it. And as it travels across the ocean, it gets to its destination port and then it unloads its ballast water. More and more ballast water regulation is more stringent on, at port destinations and ships are releasing their ballast water in the open ocean. However, as we have learned today, dumping ballast water in the open ocean, that, that it's not a desert out there. There are species that could be harmed by the dumping of ballast water and potential introduction of invasive species. So this figure shows the lionfish expansion from 1985 to 2014. So it started with just a couple lionfish sightings in Florida and is now completely exploded all in the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, out to Bermuda, and all the way up to the eastern seaboard. So this is a huge problem. And in order for the lionfish to get from over here to Bermuda, they had to go right through the Sargasso <coughs> Sea. So we know that the lionfish larvae is present in that area, even if we haven't found it in our cruises as we're the primary research vessels that cross the Sargasso Sea, it's probably out there. So this is something that we need to be further and more aware about as time goes by and lionfish populations could potentially settle. Lastly, there's the potential for plastics to carry hitchhiking organisms. So as Kata talked about, these ocean currents are moving all around the ocean, accumulating plastic in the Sargasso Sea. Now it's possible for little microorganisms to get onto the plastic and hitch a ride along to different parts of the ocean. So this is just another way for invasive species to get to different parts of the ocean. So what's being done about invasive species? So in regards to ballast water, there's been the Convention on Ballast Water Management. However, it's not yet been ratified because only 30, about 33% of the world's shipping tonnage has signed on to be signatories to the convention and it requires 35%. So it's pretty close to being there, but this was proposed in 2004. So <laughs> it's been a little while and we're still not quite there. <coughs> There's also, in terms of accidental release and invasive species management poli policies in general, there's almost no international policies regarding invasive management. Lastly, in terms of plastic, well, Kata talked about potential management regarding plastics in the ocean. There's almost no information about plastics and invasive species. So then finally, our recommendations for handling ballast water, which is the main way that we thought to target invasive species in the Sargasso Sea. We are gonna set up stringent ballast water management 
around the western management area of the Sargasso Sea where all of those ships are passing through as the previous maps have shown as on terms with the policies set up through the ballast water management convention. And then we would also like to recommend to try and pass the convention so that more areas outside of our western management area could be protected from ballast water. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Grayson. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. Our final and most overarching stressor to the Sargasso Sea is climate change. Now the main cause of climate change is anthropogenic or human emissions of carbon dioxide. And as this graph right here shows, carbon dioxide emissions have increased tremendously over the last century. These emissions negatively impact the Sargasso Sea in three main ways. Ocean acidification, increased ocean temperatures, and rising sea levels. Ocean acidification is the first one I'll talk about. And this is detrimental to any organism that uses calcium carbonate to create a shell or an exoskeleton. And in the Sargasso Sea, one such organism is the bryozoan, which is a small marine invertebrate that lives on and secretes a calcium carbonate exoskeleton onto the Sargasso. It's believed that increased ocean acidification could reduce bryozoan coverage on the Sargasso, which can cause the Sargasso to not be as heavy and thus not sink down into the deep ocean as much. Now, while this is good for the sargassum itself and for sargassum communities, it negatively impacts many deep sea scavengers that rely on this sunken sargassum as a primary food source. So thus, as ocean acidification increases, sargassum rates of sargassum sinking decline, and more organisms are impacted. The second major stressor of climate change is increased ocean temperatures. And in fact, since 1880, temperatures in the Sargasso Sea have risen by 0.91 degrees Celsius, or 1.69 degrees Fahrenheit. These increased temperatures negatively impact many species, two of which are the American and the European eels. These eels spawn only in the Sargasso Sea, and researchers have found that increased ocean temperatures have a negative correlation with the amount of eel larvae. Now, another organism that's drastically affected by ocean temperatures are corals, which are found on seamounts all throughout the Sargasso Sea. As ocean temperatures increase, this causes increased bleaching events for the corals, as well as increased mortality. And this is especially detrimental to the corals, because unlike other organisms that can escape the warming temperatures and migrate north, these corals are bounded by habitat availability, and thus cannot undergo any rain shifts. Finally, the last major stressor of climate change to the Sargasso Sea is rising sea, surface or rising sea levels, excuse me, that, for starters, poses a major problem for the island and people of Bermuda, as rising sea levels can cause increased flooding as well as increased erosion for many coastal areas. But even more important is that rising sea levels, when combined with increased ocean temperatures, has the potential to change currents all throughout the Atlantic Ocean. Increased inputs of fresh water in the North Atlantic can alter the density and deep water formation, causing water to sink not as deep and not as far, and thus alter heat throughout the entire Atlantic Ocean, as well as the strength of many currents. When trying to solve the problem of climate change, we require both mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation, for which depends on a global level, and Regarding climate change, it's a global level reduction of carbon dioxide, which is currently being done by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And in that is the Kyoto Protocol, where all participating countries, approximately 70 to 75 now, have committed to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions by 18% of their 1990 levels by 2020. But while this is happening, adaptation needs to take, needs to take place as well. And this is local and regional level action to help these ecosystems and help these organisms adapt to climate change. This can be done by mitigating other stressors, such as plastics, invasive species, shipping, fishing, as we'll hear about later, planning for future poleward rain shifts of species that can migrate north, as well as prioritizing ecosystems that cannot migrate, such as seamounts and such as the corals that are on them. 
Keeping all this in mind, moving forward, again, we want to acknowledge that climate change is an overarching systems level stressor to biodiversity in the Sargasso Sea that exacerbates all other stressors. And so we recommend that these other stressors that I mentioned in the last slide be mitigated to reduce the synergistic impacts that they pose on this ecosystem. And Joe will now list other recommendations on stressors to the Sargasso Sea. Thank you, Grayson. Um, in addition to the overarching recommendations that we have surrounding the entire Sargasso Sea, and as Grayson pointed out, on a global level, we'd also like to uh, apply some recommendations in, that we've listed in our spatial plan. Specifically, the western management area, this is the area that, was, that had intense human use that we saw on our map previous. We would, like the special, we would like this area to be designated a special area under MARPOL annexes one through six. The reason behind this being specifically that we are interested in mitigating and applying a special area for this for a variety of stressors. So uh, MARPOL annexes one through six cover a variety of locations specifically, or cover a variety of different stressors from anywhere from air to specific discharge into the oceans. This is why we've asked for We've recommended all six of the annexes. Additionally, we'd, we'd like to discuss and recommend the, the implementation of stricter standards under the annexes and stricter enforcement. We believe that if we create a priority using these annexes that we can essentially allow for a greater mitigation of stressors on the whole. With that, we'd like to thank you for your time and we will take any questions that you have. happens under one or more of the annexes. So, um, for example, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the Mediterranean Sea is a special area under annexes one and four, and parts of it are a special area under six. So you, you try and get the special area designation under one of these annexes to mitigate certain stressors that are more significant than others. Um, the Antarctic Sea Area is the most protected under these annexes, but yeah, I'm not sure about the precise process that you have to go through. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I think the Caribbean is a no discharge special area for at least a couple. Yeah. I think so. I just want to share something about invasive species. I've been working with a colleague, Dr. Kim Holzer, at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. We've been screening Bermuda as a site where we can detect animals that have hitchhiked from the and reproduced and left their water in our waters. And so far we've got seven taxa that we had not detected before. Uh, these are fairly common in vertebrates in the intercoastal, in the intertidal or subtidal habitat. So ship calls, and when you look at some of the pictures, I'm sure we'll hear about this later on, the volume of habitat floating back and forth across the Atlantic, up and down north, south, east, and west really increases that opportunity, particularly as a speed of vessel for economic efficiency, uh, delivers those animals in a, perhaps a very good state of reproductive capacity to leave those already behind. So it's a big problem in, in U.S. coastal ports. Uh, this is sort of an extension of that. And we just got a signal, we're working on a paper to compare Bermuda and Madeira, where they also have the same, uh, some of the same tax that we try to show how the mechanisms of transport are going to be have to mitigate it how we manage the vessels and vessel hull is better than we're doing. We do a pretty good job, but yeah. more to be done. So as much as the ballast water is an issue, uh, the ships themselves are a, a habitat that moves quickly. Yeah. And there is a convention on, on biofouling, but that has been passed on the ballast water. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Well, um, I want to commend you on what, on all of the uh, identification of all the stressors. And I think uh, climate change has been one of the things that I've uh, been focusing on for a lot of decades. Mm -hmm. And it's one that you get a lot of angst over. Even scientists debate it. And, and I'm, I'm pleased to hear you all looking at that problem and, and in such a way that it gives me hope that we'll see some uh, progress in the future. 
do something about it. But climate change, land-based source of pollution, habitat loss and destruction, and overfishing are the four things that I hear from people all over the world. And, and, the, and then those are all debated as which one's most important. But I just gave them in order of how I see them. And the lower four, three, we can deal with at the local regional scale. But we have to have a more resilient system to be able to respond to the larger climate change impacts. So I, I didn't have really a question as much as congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> They cannot, some scientists tend to focus on the silver bullet for one of them. Thank you, that's really good. A good paper or brand from NSF or something. They're, they work synergistically, and it's really hard to tease out any one from the other. So you have to be looking at all of them. And, and I hear that in your talk. Yeah. Thank you. I have heard you talk about filters and UV treatment of ballast water. What's the status of ballast water treatment of any sort? Yeah, so under right now there's no sort of international policy regarding ballast water treatment. Um, under the convention, treatment of ballast water is sort of their major, major way of getting rid of organisms that aren't supposed to be there. So all of that is outlined under the convention. Um, as far as look, uh, regional management of ballast water, I don't know a whole lot about that. I did a lot of research, but had a hard time finding documents outlining specific regional treatments of ballast water. So all I know is about the international policy. Okay, well, wasn't one of the strategies to exchange coastal ballast water with open ocean water yeah. do that, which of course if you're coming in, sorry, exactly. sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. exactly what you want to think. It seems great if you don't want to get coastal species A from the Mediterranean to New York and New Jersey or, or Savannah, but doesn't look so good if you're coming larger than what's going to ask the sea is going to Right. Time for one more. Yeah, uh, just building on um, what Billy was saying about, um, again, I think this is a great, uh, great presentation. One of the things that you uh, said early on, you talked about synergism, and I might call that cumulative impacts. Mm. Um, yeah. And that's and, I, and Billy mentioned that as well. You know, all these things are, are working together. So you, you sort of flagged that in your uh, in a slide, but then didn't really talk about it. And you guys want to expound a little bit about some of those synergisms that you think yeah. are important to address? Sure. Definitely, we can talk about in terms of invasive species and climate change mm -hmm. um, as climates or as habitats become more degraded, it's easier for species to have that rapid expansion and population explosions and take over on potentially unfulfilled niches, so to say. So that's one way that, and in climate change with rising temperatures, there's possible for range expansions to occur. Yeah, especially, especially with the lionfish in the Caribbean and expanding more northward. As sea surge temperatures increase, it just expands their range more and more. Yeah, in the summer they've been sighted, they've collected them right off Cape, the juveniles, and thankfully they don't survive because the winters are so cold, but there's potential for them to creep up. I think the Coral Springer just caught one uh, right off of Long Island after you guys Yeah, there's yeah. much yeah. in Long Island Sound too, so. But to kind of add on to that point, one of the major reasons we we point out climate change is one of the most significant stressors. Like the, probably the biggest reason we say that is because it has impacts that not only affect the ecosystem directly, but affect almost all other stressors that we identified. Climate change has some sort of cumulative impact with, and that's why we identified it as one of the most major stressors. So doing things like Margaret was saying that will impact invasive species, this also tends to weaken systems, almost the weaken the immune system of systems, and that's why we've identified it as the highest priority in terms of mitigating stressors. Thank you so much, Stress group.